that subsidy off overnight. And suddenly they had riots in the streets. So there, they had to get the army, they were able to get the army out and suppress it. In other places, they might not want to do that. In Iran, they've been having a lot of difficulty because they, they wanted to lift the subsidy. So that means that that country's government might determine, hey, we control this. We're not going to export it anymore. Or we're going to export less of it. Now, because of the subsidy, but also because of rising population in those countries, take Saudi Arabia, for instance, population is ballooning. <coughs> They're going to need more and more of their oil themselves, so they might choose not to export it. So there is a, there is a, um, a, um, a viewpoint which Richard may have mentioned in his talk today, um, but it's, it's a well-established one. Well, it's a recently um, uh, uh, developed idea, and that is the net export that's available, rather than just looking at the total production out there, but the net exports that are available is going to actually fall off a lot quicker. A lot quicker than the graph that we looked at earlier. So, the International Energy Agency, I mentioned before, they have a plan B, which they developed from 1970, and I've mentioned that. Now, it includes uh, the member countries are meant to have a 90-day consumption reserve. Uh, New Zealand, in fact, nobody's anywhere near that that I know of. New Zealand certainly isn't, but have made a decision to try to catch up to it. Um, but they've got other uh, actions that, uh, that they would take. The first one is that uh, there'll be um, voluntary demand reduction. So in other words, all the countries, the IEA will say, we're ringing the bell now, there is a crisis. You will now please abide by the conditions of your membership of this, uh, this, this, pa this club and you will now set about reducing your consumption by 7%, voluntary consumption. There are several levels which they uh, propose one. The second one is rationing, and that will be aimed at getting a 10% reduction, regulated rationing, and then enforced rationing. If you look at it like this, this is what they're hoping to achieve so that um, to, to, to get to uh, the 20% reduction, and if the peak year is here, that would be something like under 14 years to achieve that 20% reduction. Now, it might have to be a lot quicker than that, though. That, that's just one scenario which is coming out of a, a research paper which I will tell you about now. Um, now, University of Canterbury, uh, some people there have done some research, and what they've done is they've taken all the, um, the forecasts when the date of peak oil will be and done a probabilistic model around it, statistically evaluated to see when um, peak oil would occur according to certain probabilistic uh, probability levels. And the point of this, if you ever get exposed to that, is that you as an organisation, uh, like say us North Shore City, or you might be a, um, a transport company, you might say, well, how much risk can we take? Can we afford to have 100% certainty that peak will occur? Or because of the dynamics of our industry, we've got to plan ahead, we've got to do other things, maybe we can go for, say, a 40% certainty. That is the certainty of the date. Now, um, since then, new data's come out, and I've told you about that on that graph, where, in fact, it's probably going to be three years from now instead of a little bit further off. So now what I've done here is, um, oh, yeah, the rest of the research was looking at when would the IEA voluntary restraint come in and the rationing and so on and so forth. So that when can we see that these things are actually going to happen? How do we plan around that? When can we expect it to happen? Now North Shore, I've just taken a stab at a 50%. I've said that North Shore, uh, we can't wait because it takes, it takes us 10 years, let's say, to plan out our infrastructure. We, can't, we can take a, perhaps a 50% chance of, um, of being right on a certain date. So the 50% chance would take us around about here around about 2012. So by 2012, we're expecting it to happen. So we need to make our plans so that whatever we're doing in 2012 will be ready to go. It took us 12 years to develop the, the busway. So if we're thinking of doing the busway, son of busway, son of busway's got to start now, I and mean, it's still going to be late. And as you work your way through, it doesn't come out well on this coloration here, but you, you could expect that by 2025, there's got to be a 20% reduction in the consumption. And a 20% reduction in the consumption, if we go back to our GDP, unless we can break the bond, we're going to be looking at about a 10 or 12% reduction in the economy. That's a lot of people out of work. 
That's a lot of things not happening that are happening today. So I've mapped this out to get us an idea, because it isn't going to happen just like that overnight. There'll be some stages in it. Stage naught, that's today. I'm not going to talk about that, because we all know today. We're living in today. Uh, it's actually useful to analyze that, but I won't do that today. It's useful from the point of view of saying, well, what are we doing today? What should we do differently in the future? So in stage one, so in other words, a little bit down the track, it might be next week, it might be uh, next year, there'll be the first order effects. Price rises and it has a first order impact. And then a second with progressive price rises and then finally I'll talk about the tyranny of distance, which I think for most Kiwis you remember what that means. It's, it, New Zealand is really far away from our markets and that is a burden on us. And it might lead us to relocalization. Okay, so a few things here. Um, just to tease out the issues. In terms of transport, um, there was there were a lot of price, oil price hikes between 2002 and 2005, but the traffic didn't seem to, to diminish a lot. Why is that? There are some metrics behind this, and I'm just going to map them out. Travel demand elasticity on, on price is quite low. So if price goes up quite a lot, your response to it is quite low. It's low in the short term. About 0.15 is the figure that comes out of research. So in other words, an example, a 100% increase in price will mean that there might be 15% less traffic. Okay? Now, in the long term, people can make adjustments. They might move home, they might move jobs, might get a smaller car, they might go by passenger transport or something else. Uh, it goes up. So a 100% increase in price, there might be 25% less traffic. So looking at, um, um, well, okay, first of all, why, uh, why is this? It's actually quite logical. In terms of the household expenditure, fuel's actually a very small spending component. So in the booming economy, the congestion went on. But what if the price keeps rising? And that's what we've got to get our heads around, I think. Just looking at this, though, this is what happened. These, in, in 2003, oil was $33 a barrel. 2004, it gone up to 55. 2007, 67. And now we're looking at 75 last year, 75 on average US dollars per barrel of oil. And we look at the traffic here. Let's take Wellington. Wellington's the purple bar. Now in 2003, the traffic growth was nearly 3% over the previous year. It grew by nearly 3% in one year. But the price went up by, what's that, one and a half times. It uh, just went up, yeah, by 50-odd by percent. It had dropped off to just over 1.5 percent growth. So it's still growing, but growing a lot slower. Okay, and why was that so big compared to here's Auckland? Auckland was almost the same, almost no change. Well, Wellington's got good public transport. You've got good options. People could stop quickly traveling by car and going by train or whatever. Um, but then we look at Auckland, they woke up. By the time it got to here, the growth had dropped down to one and just over one and a half percent. So it's starting to have an effect. But the difference for Wellington didn't change because that was an example of the low food had already been picked, so to speak. Yeah. All the transport options have been taken up. I think so. The transport, yeah. But then the next thing that happens, it keeps rising. Petrol price um, keeps rising, oil price keeps rising, and look at the effect there. You can see that there, the, the, the traffic actually dropped. Now what we're looking at here is the, is the data coming out of the state highways, so this is transit, so it's on the main road, it's not all the traffic, we're talking about the main road traffic, so it's the commuter traffic going longish distances, so traveling in from 